name is Monk Rowe. I'm off camera for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. I'm very pleased to be speaking with saxophonist Ralph Lalama today. Welcome back to Utica, New York. Thank you, Monk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's nice to be here. We had a nice, good gig yesterday. Two gigs. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's nice. Yeah, people are nice around here. I used to play here. You know, yeah. I used to tinies and do some concerts and did a stuff, a bunch of stuff for uh, JR. A, a couple of benefits for Phyllis. I remember with Nick and Joe Mags and, uh, and you know Rick and Rick. I remember Rick Jr. Rick Jr. Right? Me too. But, I mean, I mean, but when he was tiny, yeah. you know, like he would sit in with us. Right. And yesterday he played the gig, the gigs right. with Isn't us. Isn't that something? Yeah, it's fun. It sort yeah. of makes you feel like oh. wait, I'm that old. <laughs> right. right, right. Uh, I was told Utica. I'm not a native here, but I'm from Rochester. But I was oh, yeah. told that Utica used to be. Uh, like a midway point, sort of guys would travel yes. with the throughway and that's right. And come to you, come between Rochester. You know, I, I have a. I don't know if this is part of the question, but I'm going to say it. I have an affinity here for upstate New York because I'm from Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been living in New York for about 35 years now. But I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I went to school at Youngstown State University. And the, why that's relevant is there was a guy that was going to school at the time. He just got off of Woody Herman's band. His name was Tony Leonardi. And he was from Syracuse, okay? So he grew up with Sal, he played with Chuck, and you know, and he played with Joe Romano, and Nick, and uh, probably JR too. And, 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 but so Tony was kind of my mentor, you know, even though we were in school, he was about 11 years older than me. And, and he, in, in Youngstown State, he started, a, a, the, the, which was a, at that time a one hour elective jazz man. It wasn't part of the curriculum, really, except for it was elected. So my point is then I got, you know, Tony turned me on to all kind of great, you know, he heard I played it. I auditioned for the band. I didn't know the man. I just auditioned for the band. I, I made it. And then we started becoming friends, turned me on to all these kids. Then I remember he invited Sal Mystico to the school so we could hear him, you know. And he played with us, you know, and I get to know Sal. Now, then when I moved to New York, Sal, all, I lived in Queens, Elmhurst, Queens. And at that time, Sal lived in Rigo Park. And Sal was nice enough, you know, because he remembered me and he knew I was trying to play, you know, you know and all that stuff. And he, uh, so he, he put me on some of his gigs, you know, like quartet gigs. He made him a quintet for little Ralphie to play. You know what I mean? You know, right out of school, I was in my early 20s. Then I got on Woody Herman's band, which Sal was there. And Tony Leonardi played. You know, I didn't play with them, I mean, in Woody's band, but, but they were alumni. Joe Romano, I met Joe coming in New York, and then Nick I played with up here, you know. The only one I didn't know that well was J.R., because he was already gone, uh -huh. kind of when I started to feel. So I always feel like, not that this is my home, but I always felt like very close to the, to the guy, upstate guys because of Tony, and then Sal, and then Joe, you know, and even Chuck, you know. And all these, all these upstate guys are... Last name always ends with a vowel. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, isn't it about Italian? Well, that's yeah, it. The it. Lavano, La Lama, you know, some Nestico. Either no. zeros or A's, <laughs> you know. Very interesting. Yeah, it is. There's a true. couple books have come out recently about that. Uh huh. Italian Americans in the, in yeah. the jazz world. That's right. That's true. That's definitely. Uh, I, I wanted to pose a question to you. Um, if you if you were able to write your own entry about yourself for a new coming jazz book, like a jazz mm -hmm. encyclopedia, and, uh, and you could actually write it yourself. And mm -hmm. You might say, Ralph LaLama sounds reminiscent of pl blank and blank, like two tenor players. Oh, two tenor. Who would you pick? I would probably have to say Sonny Rollins and Hank Mobley. Well, you know, it's interesting because the guy who wrote the entry for the Grove Encyclopedia of Jazz said exactly that. Oh, did he? Yeah. Okay. I'm yeah. not sure of his name, but I just looked in there and it's exactly what it said. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That those were like big influences on yeah. him. And I noticed yesterday, I was so pleased when you started out the concert with that Hank Mobley tune. Oh, yeah, this I dig of you. Yeah. Yes, 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 that's right. Not yeah. many people, yeah. well, at least in my experience, yeah. haven't heard that played a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because that's my influence. I mean, you know, I mean, I remember when I was growing up, you know, that was in the you know, and you know, I mean, my jazz growing up, let's put it that way, was in the '70s, and everybody was trying to play like Coltrane, you know, 
and as and I like Coltrane. I mean, he I definitely he's one of my influences too, and, and Joe Henderson and those guys. But I was always towards the sunny thing, you know. And then moving to New York, I was different because I was trying to play like sunny. Anybody else is going train, you know. You know, I don't know. That probably helped me a little bit and hindered me a little bit, you know. You know what I mean? Because they wanted if they if they wanted the status quo, they would they would hire me. If they wanted somebody a little different, they would hire me. <laughs> you know. And I didn't do that for any business reason. That's just what I, I was, you know, turned on by. Well, you know? what, at the time, can you put into words what was the different approach? If, if you were more into Sonny than Train? Well, less notes? Less notes, more melody, more rhythm. I mean, you know, not that Train didn't play with rhythm. I don't want to be t quoted as saying that, but Sonny had a sp special spontaneity. T melodic and rhythmic spontaneity, I think. Compared to Trey, Trey was more practiced, you know, and even though I mean it worked, <laughs> yeah. you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not, you know, it's not a put down by any means. It's just that's just what I attracted to. I, but I just went toward because that's what I like. You know, you, you just got to be honest with yourself, you know. And back then in Youngstown and and and, and prior to that, <clears throat> so my father used to listen to it. He used to listen to Sonny Stitt and Gene Ammons and Stan Getz. You know, I didn't even hear Sonny Rollins and Trey at first. You know, we even tried it until I met Tony. You know, mm -hmm. I, mean, I heard of them, but I, I wasn't there. I, they, it wasn't in the air in my house. I heard Stitt, you know, and singers. My mother was a singer. My father was a drummer. You know, so I had music, you know, in the house. It was in the air. That's why I like to put it, you know. Yeah. I like James Brown, you know, because I mean, you're a kid, you know. You, not that I didn't like jazz. I did. I liked it. I like, I, I, but I, James Brown, when you're growing up, you have, you know, that's my generation. James sure. Brown and the Temptations, you know. You know. And you got your rhythmic dose from that. That's certainly. right, totally. From from James, oh, definitely. I definitely, oh, no doubt about it. <laughs> I think you can learn a lot, um, even if you're a jazz player, from listening to like what those horn players are playing behind them yeah. and all those yeah. little... In the rhythm players. section, the feeling, the feeling. Yeah. James Brown, I still love it. I mean, that's to me, that's how, that's how good it is. Because when I put it on now, I enjoy it now, after all I've been through <laughs> in the musical, you know, musical set, I still enjoy it as much. You know, mm -hmm. so to me that's true art. You know, that might not be in the books as art, but to me it is because I, I get a kick out of it. You know, it's not just nostalgic either. It's, it's a feeling. You know, you know. You had uh, your big band experiences um, under three kind of different leaders. You had Mel mm -hmm. Lewis and Buddy Rich and Woody, and Woody Herman. Yes. Uh, who'd you enjoy the most? Well, and that's I can't. I, I that's a hard. I, I, could I, I I could explain Please. a certain way. Well, I, my first band was Woody Herman, and that was like my first professional jazz gig, so to speak. Even though I played a lot of gigs, but I mean I don't mean professional as far as getting paid, but upper echelons mm -hmm. jazz, you know, you know. And and Woody and I just learned a lot. I learned a lot from Woody because of the fact that as I I. Uh, I just I finally realized what a leader expect a leader a leader had to trust you, you know. I don't mean just showing up on time, but the music and showing up on time and you know and just being there for the gig. Yes, that's when he starts ligging you when he trusts you, you know. And that was a big lesson for me, you know. I, I mean, it just hit me one day. Oh man, these, that, that, that's what, that's how you get along. If, if the trust, leader, yeah. To trust you to not only play but. Be there. Be there. Yeah, you know, yeah, no, yeah, just be there, just be, you know. But even the music, too. Well, musically, too, they have to trust you. you. When you go up to play, like say a solo, they're going to be, uh, you're going to be right, you know. You know? I'm not saying you can't make a mistake. That, I don't mean, I'm just saying, you know, just the attitude, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, and then I went, okay, then I went to Buddy Rich, and, and I really enjoyed that, too, because well, Buddy was a lunatic, but still, he was a real musician, you know. You know, I, I, I'm I'm not totally agreeable when I hear all these stories. Not that they weren't true, but his attitude really wasn't like. And he was a musician, you know what I mean? He, and he wanted things right, you know. I can tell you a couple stories. I remember one time he, he we the whole trumpet section was gone, and he, he we they hired all these guys from North Texas State. And they couldn't. They really weren't up to snuff. I mean, they couldn't handle, you know. And you, I, fi we all figured, oh, buddy, he's gonna go crazy. He's gonna. He didn't say a word. He just fired him. He gave him there two weeks. Later. He, could, you know why? Because he knew they weren't, you know, that talented. <laughs> but he holler, He would holler at you if he knew you were talented and you weren't doing the job. 
See? So I respected that. You know what I mean? And I remember another time as far as he, he invited Mel Lewis to the band because he couldn't even get dressed. He had some this back problem with his discs. He couldn't get dressed, right? So I mean, I remember they had to they had to help him get dressed, he would get dressed on the bus. And uh I remember that but Mel was there for a week but didn't play one beat. Because Buddy would, after all that pain, I mean, I saw this guy was in pain. You know when somebody's in pain. They're not faking it, you know. Oh, okay. So, and he would go up and play like nothing was wrong. And then he'd go back to the, oh, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't, oh, he, I mean, really, he was in pain. But he had Mel Lewis there, but Mel didn't play a note. Okay, now one time, now in London, <laughs> in London, I end up, uh, we were there for a month. We were at Ronnie Scott's for a week. But uh, I was I, I got sick during Ronnie Scott. I had the flu. I had to go to the doctor. I mean, I was had 103 temperature. I had a terrible flu. And then and then Marcus and uh, Steve Marcus and Andy Fusco went to Buddy's room. And said, Buddy, man, Ralph is sick. I mean, I don't know if he could. Play. And he goes, Is he dead? <laughs> they said no. And then so I went on a bandstand and I played. You know, I think he, he called almost every two that I played on too. Okay, but you know what? That didn't. I mean, if you told that. If you tell that story out of context, that sounds like Buddy's not a very nice human being. But I could dig him because when he was sick, he played. Even though he had he had a sub on Mel Lewis on the bus, Mel didn't play one note. Okay, so he so, wouldn't ask you to do anything. To that do. that's right. That's what I got from that. You know what I mean? You know. So to me, that's what I mean. I mean that you know he's crazy, but I could dig it. <laughs> you know, I learned a lot. And then technically, in that band, you played much more notes. You know, you, there was a lot more, I don't mean complicated, but there were, there was, for me as a saxophone player, I learned a lot about the saxophone technique because of some of the music we played. You know, it was like hard and, so, and that was another step. Okay. And now, then I, Mel and Thad, when I got to New York, I, I mean, I, I knew Thad. I met Thad at Youngstown. Tony Leonardi got Thad to come to Young. So I used to sub on the band. My first gig in New York was was with Mel and Thad, but it wasn't a big band, it was a quintet. So that flipped me out. <laughs> you know, that was my first gig. You know. Is that you said something yesterday with, um, you said you learned more on that gig yeah, oh, in that's the first right. few weeks than you did in, yeah. in, in college. Yeah. What do you learn on your first, I mean, what was so memorable about Well, that? just the, in, what, what the thing sounded like around you, <laughs> you know, and then how, how they handled playing, you know, these are masters of playing jazz music, you know. And I was just out of college. I mean, Tony Leonardi was great, believe me, I learned a lot from him. But now this is experience in it. This is, that's what I mean. Even with now you said about the band, like Thad and Mel or Mel Lewis band, that was more like real life. And, you know, I mean, you dealt with a lot, you know, it's in your hometown, which is now New York, you know, you go to work, and, you know, and then just the music was so ridiculously challenging at the time, especially, and you're with Thad Jones and Mel Lewis and everybody else in the band when I was subbing, and these Pepper Adams, <laughs> you know, Jerry Dodgen, you know what I mean? All these guys. <laughs> I said, what? You know? <laughs> Bob Brookmeyer, you know? I mean, you know, I'm a kid, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, so... The, the, summa, the for summation, uh, and this is not, I don't want to make this sound weird, but because it's not like this, but just to compare it, I would say Woody was like high school, Buddy was like college, and Mal was like life. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the way I would answer your question, even though it took me a half hour to answer your question. That's okay. <laughs> I like long answers. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can phrase this question correctly, but. Uh, in improvisation, jazz improvisation, yeah. to you, what constitutes a wrong note? Oh. Well, okay, that's a good question. Well, it's, it's like beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, okay? I think there are wrong notes. A lot of people don't. I do. I really do. Because, well, you have a, you have a background, you have a chord, you know, and then you, you can use all 12 notes, but it's how you organize them. You know what I mean? It's the organization. Sometimes you might put a, a wrong note on a, in a wrong part of the beat or something, wrong place in the beat, and it sounds wrong. It just, you, I just get this tension up my spine. <laughs> you know what I mean? But then technically you could play a wrong note. Technically, I mean, theoretically it could be a wrong note, but it sounds right. <laughs> you know, because you placed it. Thad Jones was the master of that, you know? 
You know, Coltrane too, you know, Sonny Vaughan, all those masters, Joe Anderson. They, as far as theoretically, in other words, when you have a chord, you have a scale and you have the chord tones. So if you play outside of that, it could be considered wrong, you know. But if you know how to phrase it exactly right and resolve it right, that's, that's another thing. It's in the resolution. You can resolve a wrong note and make it right, see. You know, and then it's sometimes, I know I, when I hit a wrong note, like I said, I fill up my spine, you know, and I usually hear it from my wife. <laughs> and, uh, no, and are you joking? Huh? Are you joking? No, my wife is a great singer, Nicole Pasternak, she's a great singer. Okay. And uh, it's just great ears, you know, you know what I mean? And, you know, but I'm, but I'm just, I mean, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not. I'm serious about what I'm saying, but, I, but I'm just saying, like, you know, she actually doesn't holler at me, but she says, you know, you could tell, I know she, she could tell what I hear. But, because I'm trying, see, nothing about wrong notes, when you're trying to improvise, sometimes you get, you get hung up, you know. So, you know, if you just play all your licks that are comfortable and all your, all your stuff, then you're not going to mess up, you know. Yeah, I don't think you're really improvising, you know. You know I, mean? I mean, like Monk, Monk, I figured a Monk. Yeah. Bing! You know, it's obviously not a wrong note, but it sounds right, you know. It sounds, you know, a tension. See, that's another thing. There's tension. Let's put it this way. There's tension notes and there's wrong notes. Ah, ah that's very good, Ralph. <laughs> we'll quote you on that. Yeah. You, you'll make our uh, little uh, snippets of good quotes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. But, you know, I, I noticed yesterday in listening to you. A lot of wrong while, notes. Well, no, every <laughs> once in a while, you would end a phrase huh. with a note yeah. that made me go, Ooh, yeah. It's like it literally, yeah. like gee, I wish I I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah, but yeah. it sounded pretty cool. Well, that's what I mean. That was tension. That wasn't wrong. Hopefully, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. I mean that's the way I would interpret it. I don't know. I mean I I've been doing that a lot more lately. I've been trying to get a little more modern. I don't know that. I don't want. I don't like that term. Yeah, but, I know what you mean. Yeah, but I, I just in other words, I'm just experimenting. Just like you know, I, I hopefully all these improvisers do. You know, you don't want to be complacent. You know, I don't. I, you know, I, I get that's boring to me. You know, and and I, you know, so I started at a very, uh, what would be very concrete, but that's not the but consonant. I was more consonant when I first started playing. You know, you know, mm -hmm. which is actually a lot of my upstate influence. You know what I mean? And, and and then as I got older, and you know, you start hearing more, and you know, hearing other guys too. I get influenced by other people. You know. I'll be honest about that. I I definitely influenced by what things around me, you know, at the moment, mm -hmm. you know, at, at different places, different cultures, you know. I'm lucky I get to go around the world, you know. You, you know, you, you uh, spent some time in Italy, right? Oh yeah. So what do you do over there? Well, I, I do some teaching over there, and uh, and actually with the Vanguard band, we, we go once a year to a CC where we play a couple concerts, and we also uh, do clinics, you know. And at one time I did something for the Manhattan School of Music about five years in a row. We went to a place close to Venice, it was called Costa Franco, where we were there for two weeks doing, you know, all teaching and playing too, playing too as, as concerts, the faculty played at night, and then uh, we taught all day. Two weeks. I did that for about five years in a row. Wow. Yeah, that was nice. Yeah. And then the other time, just go there, spots, you know. I went to Spain, did, 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 did a couple, couple clinics there, you know, on my own stuff. And then with the bands too, you know, so I go there with, uh, with the Vanguard band. We'll, we'll do clinics individually and as sections sometimes. Do the people over there, uh, I don't know if respect is the right word. Mm -hmm. Do they think of jazz uh, as more significant yeah. than here? Yeah, because this is our gift to them. This is the only original art form that America has to offer. Original art form. I mean, rock and roll is not original. It's not American. You know, classical music is not original. I mean, there's a lot of American composers, but they're not original. I mean, they might be original in their own music, but I'm saying the, the idea of classical music wasn't, it's not American. Right. But the idea of jazz is America. It's an original American art form. So this is our gift to Japan, our gift to Germany. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people try to copy. It. So they, they, I would say, respect it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Very much. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Totally. <clears throat> um. You had a statement yesterday. Actually, just to follow up about rock and roll. 
mm -hmm. have an issue with the way people behave. Well, I, I, did. <laughs> like, well, you know, I don't know why I said that, but it's true. I mean, that used to make me mad, you know. These little old Puerto Rican ladies have to clean up this mess that these guys, I mean, they didn't have to break bottles. I mean, we, I party too. Oh, it's my phone. <laughs> edit. Where's my phone? Where's my phone? I should check it. This is embarrassing. That's all right. We can edit this. Okay, one. okay. <clears throat> Jeez. I, I, you know what? I'm not going to even answer it. I don't even know who that is. Okay. I'll shut it off. I bet I know who it was now. Who? Talking about rock and roll, it's probably Eric Clapton or something. <laughs> Calling you Ralph, what are you doing uh, next week? Yeah, right. So I can't make it. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Um, so we were uh, mm -hmm. just talking about rock and roll yeah. and <clears throat> behavior that sometimes is associated with that music. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and I decided, I just, would, would you appreciate it if your mother had to clean up? I mean, because, you know, I spent a lot of time in hotel rooms, you know. Yeah. You know, and, I, you know, and I'm not saying, like, I didn't party. So I don't break glass and have, you know, I just, I just, I don't know. I just think, you know, these guys, that's disrespect. And sometimes the music sounds that way to me. Not everybody. I mean, you know, I, I love Jimi Hendrix. You know, I loved a lot of people, that, you know, when I was growing up, especially, you know. Yeah. They had something to say, you know. Right. I mean, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not against that, you know, not at all. I'm James Taylor, I don't know if that's how rock and roll, but, you know. Who was that, Laura Nero, who was the other one? Uh, Carol King, I used to like Carol King's music. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, Jimi Hendrix, I love Jimi Hendrix. But I didn't like the cream that much. <laughs> but I like Jimi Hendrix, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, you know, you it's know. to learn from everybody, I guess. Yeah. And speaking of learning, I have this thing that, came to me yesterday when you were playing, mm -hmm. and it has something to do with teaching, I think, because you can learn the real book tunes and all mm -hmm. that, but mm -hmm. there's stuff that you guys did yesterday that I wondered where it came from, and mm -hmm. one example would be you you did the, the tune like Someone in Love, mm -hmm. and near the end of it, mm -hmm. right at the end, you you played a lick as a sort of a tag. Yeah, that's it right. It sounded like, <clears throat> my mama done told me. Exactly right. right. Yeah. That's my Woody influence. So where does that come from, and how do you, as a teacher, get your kids to learn all that? Okay, so, <clears throat> that's my experience. That's where it came from. I didn't think about it. I, I, we used to play Woody's man. My mama that told me to bring him, you know, I mean, the, whatever the words, you know, blues in the night. And and then you know that's something when you live the stuff. See, that's what I mean. But when you learn it in the real book, sometimes you're not living it unless you play it for a couple of years. <laughs> you know, a song, let's say. And that's all. And then that came to my mind because that, that, you know, that's, I, that was part of my musical growing up, you know. Okay. <clears throat> so, so that thing wasn't an outro, so to speak, that I should have known about. No. You, okay, you just... That was mine. That, but, yeah, it, you yeah. know, yeah. it sounded just like yeah. it was part of the... It was well, it fit. Part I, try, well, I try to be mo melodic and yeah. musical. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah you got to make all this fit, hopefully, yeah. you know. Yeah. And that's the experience, you know. Right. You know? And but was, yeah, but there was a couple other yeah. things too, like some intros and stuff that, that you don't see in the in the real world. Yeah, they're not there. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess that as a teacher you may pass those on to your students. I might I might show them different ways they could go with things and think right. and then <clears throat> my, the reason why I would do that, not that they would copy me, maybe copy me for a little bit, but maybe so they could they, they, they so they realize they have the freedom to do that. Use their own ingenuity, their own creative. You know, you, you don't have to just read it like a book. Because a lot of people when they learn from the real books and stuff they think, oh, we have to do it like the book. Oh, the book says that, you know. I said, no, it's not. <laughs> I mean, that's, just a, that's not the Bible. All it is is a guide, you know. Mm -hmm. That's the same way you play chord changes, you know. Because it says this doesn't mean you can't use that, you know. But it has to sound right, you know. That's what I mean. That's where the taste comes in, you know. And the difference <clears throat> between tension and wrong. Aha, <laughs> uh <-huh>, there we go. <laughs> <clears throat> You know what? You can use that when you go back and teach. Yeah, it. well, I do. I think I do, but I'll even use it more because it makes more sense now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of the real book and and the um, the number of tunes in it mm -hmm. that date back to the the Great American Song. Oh sure. Yeah. How come? 
how come those songs that were not really written as jazz tunes mm -hmm. per se mm -hmm. offer such a, a rich, uh, you know, palette of... Well, because that, you said it, it, it because it's it's the, the, the songs really, you could improvise on them. They're, they're, they're made perfectly to, to improvise. Because <clears throat> see, <clears throat> I don't want to get too technical, but to me, improvise is, is about tension to release. You have a tension and you release it. In other words, you resolve it, okay? You know? And even when you don't resolve it, you can still, the tension, can, like you said, it's up in the air to be resolved, you know? And that's all right, too, you know? And a lot of these American songbooks have that. They have the tension to the release. And to put it in musical theoretical terms, it's the dominant to the tonic. And these tunes that we're talking about, this, that's all it's about. You go through, like you might be in one key, but within that form, you go to about five keys. What does that mean? You have to have the tension to the release, tension to the release, tension to the release. So that's perfect for a jazzer to want to deal with it, to improvise. You know, it's like, it's like, <clears throat> it's like putting a, a carrot in front of a rabbit, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> well, do you find it harder than or a different kind of challenge to improvise, like um, a tune like "So What," mm -hmm. where you've just got yeah, you got right. two chords mm -hmm. and they're just exactly. I understand what you mean. Well, to me, that's almost sometimes harder. Yeah, for me, you know, because I mean, just for the fact. Well, but the, the more I study music, the more I realize how many tensions are in there. See, at first I just looked at it as one thing, mm -hmm. the Dorian mode, let's say. Yeah. But nah, it's more than that. You know, you can start. You start learning how you could. Uh, that's the foundation. You know, you could learn how you start building upon it. You know, so and I'm still working on that. You know, thinking about that. You know, and then you can relate that to the other songs too. See, that's enough. that's what guys are doing today. They're taking their modal kind of things and putting it on these standards. You know, you know, inside the, the tension to the release. You know, you know, you know what I'm saying. I don't know. I, I don't want to get too technical, but that's that's kind. Of, that's simple, I think. You know. Just tension to release, so you could add tensions to that to that long, you know, sixteen bars of D Dorian. <clears throat> you could look at it a lot of different ways, yeah. you know. But at first, it was much, to me that was much, all that space made it a little much harder for me, you know, for me, not the rest of the world. Because I came from Tia, Tony, the upstate Tia, uh, uh, Tony Leonardi school, selling this go change, 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 change you know. Yeah. And which I love, <laughs> you know. But I'm just saying, that's when, when I got to So What, I said, what do I do? <laughs> D. Dorian for 18,000 years, you know. <laughs> I know it goes up a half step, too, but I'm right, just saying, right. you know. But, you know, but I mean, but to me, they're both great. I'm not, you know. Yeah. You know, but, you know, but, but yeah, both of them has challenges. Because that's hard to resolve and with all that movement with keys, you know, in their songbook. That's, that's hard, too, because you got, you got to know your keys, you know. But you got to know your keys when you're talking about superimposition on the on the Dorian mode. See, so it's all the same, really. Is there a no. short list of things that you really want your students to be able to do by the time they move on and graduate oh, or whatever? Oh, sure. And what might be a couple of them? Well, play in time, <laughs> have a good tone, you know, play in time with the rhythm, not just rhythmically correct, but the harm the harmonic rhythm. The harmonic rhythm, you know what I mean? That means like when you're playing these standards or playing, playing the modal stuff. This when you're playing the harmony, it has to it has to have the rhythm of the harmony has to resolve in the right places. Because there's corny places to resolve and there's hip places to resolve. You know what I'm saying? So and and not to get too into it, but you know that's what I that's my criteria. You know I got you you got to learn how to do that. You know. If you want to be my student, you know, you have, to, you know, and, that, and it's great. They love it because they, because now they're starting to make sense what they're playing. Mm -hmm. you know? you know, what method do you use in a lesson? Do, do you play chords with them at the Sometimes, piano? sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes I play on the saxophone, yeah. you know, something cool. If they don't hear it, I go to the piano and say, you're playing this. I, you know what I'll do? I'll play, here's the chord, here's the note you landed on. And they say, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah now I know what you mean by wrong intention. You know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there it goes again. Wrong. Well, <laughs> well what uh, along the similar lines, what makes things 
either individually or as a rhythm section? What makes things swing? Ooh, that's a, that's a good, what makes things swing? Okay, well, it's a feeling. Hmm, how can I say, I mean, technically what makes things swing? If you could, if you were listening to a rhythm section or you were on one of those gigs just like yeah. this weekend yeah. where you get with a group uh -huh. and you can tell we have to the first couple of tunes. Well, this man, this this band really swings. This yeah, really yeah. Good. Or yeah. this thing does not really swing. We're swinging. That's Is right. Is it possible to put that into words? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll try. No, no, I'm I'm understanding it better. To me, when, when people play together more and they're in the same thought zone, that usually usually swings. You know, and not that all swinging is the same. But it's usually off. The, it gets off the ground. I like to put it. You know what I mean? And you know, it's, it's magic that happens. And that's usually a swinger. You know what I mean? Now, the technical thing is the way they play the eighth notes. In other words, some guys. I know I have a lot of students who come in out of high school, and they they think swinging is ta 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 da ta ta da ta ta da. To me, you're putting the you're putting the the eighth note. The two eighth notes, like more like a dotted eighth and a sixteenth, and that's not it. That's not. It's not da 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 da. da, da. It's more of a triplet. Boo to d t k ch t to t triplet 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 triplet. See, so that's the technical thing. So you got to either, and and it's not just the drummer. And the, and the bass player, it's also the horn players too. They'll play. They play da 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 da. da, da. You know, they do that. So, you know. That's not it, you know. So that adds to the not swing. And then why does it not swing? Because one guy may be swinging, and the other guy's going da 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 da. So that's not together. So that, as a band, that's not happening. It's not gelling. It's not magic. You know what I mean? It's not getting off the ground. It's not leaving the earth. You know what I mean? Okay. But when it is leaving the earth, you know, the same with a funk band. You're a great funk band. It's the same thing. Why they're so together? You know, it leaves you, it leaves you right off the ground. You know what I mean? You know, a symphony orchestra, when it's totally together, it's swinging, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's not swinging in, ski, ski. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about togetherness, you know? And then the world can learn a lot from that, too. The politicians can learn a lot from that. The Democrats and the Republicans can learn a lot about that. Doing it together. You know what I mean? Not fighting. I say black, you say orange. I say, uh, you know, furnace, you say snowflake. Continue, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Don't uh, edit that. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Yeah, this, I, may, I thought of this question when you said your voice was a singer. Um, do you play a melody of a tune differently if it has a well-known lyric? You know, uh, yeah, I, ever since I've been married, yes. <laughs> I mean, because no, now I know the, a lot of the words. I, I'm not going to lie to you and say I studied the words, even though Lester Young did, a lot of people do. But I uh, play with my wife a lot more, you know, and I hear the lyrics. You know, I, you know I'm on the bandstand, we're, I'm listening to her sing, you know. I said, wow, that's a great lyric. And she's great, and she writes lyrics, you know. And she, you know, we just did a gig at the at uh, Cornelia Street in, 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 the, in the village. It was Poe Jazz. And the reason why they hired her, and they hired me too, but they hired her, was because she wrote a lot of lyrics on, on, uh, on not an American songbook, but the jazz, like Mika's Dream, Dolphin Dance, uh, Sugar by Stanley Turretty. Uh, so, so they wanted her to do it, to hear her lyrics on these songs. And they hired me too, because I played, you know. But, uh, but uh, you know, that's how good she is. So, and then when she sings the song, I really hear the lyrics, you know. So it made me appreciate the lyrics more, and the song more, definitely. And now I, I th hopefully I do. I play differently now that I I can't recite every lyric. You know, I remember like the bridge. I remember what it's trying to say. You know what I mean? You know, what I mean, not maybe not specifically all the time. You could quote it like she could, but I know what it's just you know trying to yeah. say. You know, it helps. You know, yeah, soulful, man. It's much more soulful. What's it like to? Uh... Is your wife a professional? I mean, does she make her? Oh, own yeah. Scene? Well, she did. She had a day job, too, but no, she's been professional for a long oh, time. Yeah. We What's have a couple of records. Out. We have a record out together. Okay. In a word. Nice. Don That's Friedman, fun. Dennis Irwin, Ralph Lalama, and uh, Nicole Pashnak with no drums. Wow. And it's called In a Word. Now, this is, check this out. It's called In a Word because all the titles of the songs are one word Smile, you know, yeah. For, You. Uh, you know, I can't remember everything. But, uh, you know, it's like 12 tunes or something. 
and they're all uh, one word. So the name of the CD is called In a Word. What's it like to uh, make a living as a <laughs> as musicians? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's challenging, but it's fun, and it's you know, I mean, I'm so into it now, you know. I could probably answer that question better 20 years ago, you know, but, but you know what I mean? But now, I mean, it's just a way of life. I don't, I, it's like, it's just the way it is. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of, and it's a challenge business-wise, challenge financially, and a challenge uh, to, to better yourself in the midst of all that, you know what I mean? And to make a living, you know? But I'm lucky. I, I, have, I have to, you know, like I said, I always had pretty good gigs, and I, and I teach too, which I like. I really, I'm not a guy that doesn't like it. I teach two, two schools, NYU, for 23 years, and SUNY Purchase for about 10 or 11. And, uh, you know, I teach privately too. But, and I do clinics, you know, concerts, you know. And, uh, you know, and I still play. You know, I have a full schedule. So that's why I make a living, you know. And I make a living, you know. Again, I'm not sure how to ask this question, but I'll try. Um... Monk, you're doing you're, a great you're job. You're like a pardon? You're doing a great job. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good question. I'll keep going. Though. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, you're you're a middle-aged uh, white guy. <laughs> it's been my astute observation. <laughs> I like it. Does that, does that affect? Yeah, you're. Okay. Does that affect uh, getting gigs? You know. Okay, that's a great question. I'll go back to when I grew up. I grew up. In, near Pittsburgh, in a place called Aliquippa, Pennsylvania, West Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. And my grandmother, or my, my mother's mother, lived in a part of Aliquippa, which was called Plan 11. Now, Plan 11 was all black, except for one white family, hers. Okay? And when I was a kid, we would go there on Sunday and see my grandparents, hang out in the yard. And next to the yard was a, another ball field where, you know, the, the cats would play, the neighborhood would play. And eventually I would go start playing with her, you know. So I learned how to play sports, you know, with, with pretty good players, you know. And then I went to high school, and I ended up knowing these guys in high school. So I kind of knew them before I got to high school. I went to Catholic school in West Alacoba, which there was no black people in West Alacoba, okay. So I never even thought about it, because these, these guys are my friends, you know, we used to use racial slurs all the time, and it was not, it was nothing. It was like, hey man, how you do, how you do, and that's not what the words we used, right, okay. but that's where we talked, and I had no problem until I got to New York, and I heard I wasn't supposed to talk like that. And I said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> no, okay, now, I'm on the jazz scene with this supposed to be racial stuff. And I'll tell you another story. You know, you ever hear Stanley Crouch? Yes. Okay. I, was, I, I used to play with this guy named Sadiq Hakim, who his real name was Argon Thornton. He, he used to play with Bird. He, grew, he was a kid when he played with Bird. He, was, when he, he lived with Bird, and he wasn't that good. He was learning how to play. He wasn't Bud Powell, but he, Bird let him play with him. He even did a record with Bird. And, uh, and it, Argon now is, is grown up, and I, and I moved to New York, and he befriended me. Okay? He was an older black guy, great piano player at that time. And... Sorry, his name now. It's Sadiq Hakim. Okay. Sadiq Hakim. Yeah, he's dead now. Mm -hmm. But but he lived in the Lower East Side, and uh, you know, and, but he was a real jazzer, man. He kind of played between. He had original thing. He wrote thousands of tunes. He, he, had, he had original, a lot of originals that either sound like between Monk and Duke and Horace. Mm -hmm. Those kind of tunes. He wrote great tunes. And every time he he was he was pretty famous, so he would do a lot of trio games. And he would have quartet gigs. He would use me because he, you know, because I would go play with him a lot. And I liked his tunes. So we, we got and he heard so I guess he liked me. So, so, so one time there was a place called the Tin Palace. And uh, and then uh, uh, then our, uh, so Sadiq got a gig there, and then he was going to use me. And Stanley Crouch used to book it. And, and then he goes, and Stanley he said, uh, he said, who you have in a group? I, blah, blah, blah. I have. Uh, I had this tenor player you probably never heard of named Ralph Lalama. No, I never heard of him. No, no, no. Is, then he, is it white? Yeah, no, no, no. I don't, don't get get Junior Cook. Okay, so okay. So Sadiq told me this. Okay, so I go I go to the Tin Palace when they were playing, and I brought my horn to sit in. See, and I love Junior Cook. He was a bling. I didn't. I wasn't trying to blow any. I couldn't <laughs> about it because I was a kid. You know. But anyway, make a long story short. So 
I, I went there and played, and then Stan, you know, you know, he, he said, okay, this is, you know, this is Ralph Lalonde, okay. And I, I could have got out on Stanley, and I didn't. I, something told me no. Because Stanley, I knew, was, you know, he's a writer. I like Stanley, actually. But at that time, I didn't really like him too much, you know. Okay, then now, 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 he wrote, then I, I, I'm forward. About 10 years later, he wrote, and now I'm on the scene more now. You know, and Stanley comes down to the vanguard. He knows who I am. Okay, so so he wrote an article called in the Village Voice called "The Tale of the Tenor." You know, in other words, talking about from you know back to Chewberry to you know to now. At that time, probably like this is about, about 12, 15 years ago. But it was 10 years later after the scene at the Tin Palace. And then, to make a long story short, in the <laughs> in the he was talking about Lester Young, Coltrane, Sonny Rock, all the great tenor players. Blah, blah. Then at the end, he's talking about now we got guys like uh, blah blah blah. We got this guy. We got this guy. We got Joshua Redman. We got, and then and then the the three Caucasian tenor players that I like today on the New York scene is Ralph Lalama, Joe Lovano, and Mike Brecker. I said yes. <laughs> so I mean, because I had a little restraint. Because I really, see, that, it didn't bother me because, like, the way I grew up. That's why I, I didn't mean to tell you this long story, but you asked the questions. So, and, and I had a history with it, you know. I never thought that way because I know it's black music. That's why I liked it, <laughs> you know, because to me, this music is killing, you know, because I can't, I really don't like white music, to tell you the truth. I'm serious. I, that's what bothers me sometimes about rock and roll, too. You know, but it's just a little too Caucasian for me. And I'm just telling you the truth. Okay, okay that's the way I grew up. What am I going to do? So anyway, so the point of it is, is that, you know, he wrote that. So it all worked out. You know what I mean? He wrote that thing about, you know, put my name in the paper with those guys, too, with Levano and Michael. You know, that was great. You know? And uh, so it worked out. But I guess, I guess in some people's mind, it does hinder you. And, probably, and in some people's mind, it helps you, too, you know, I guess. You know, because some people won't hire you because you're white, I guess. And some people... We'll hire you because you're white, you know. You know, but I have a lot of friends. I don't really think of that way. I really don't. I know, I, you know, people do, and I. But I don't. I don't care. I don't. You know, these guys are friends of mine. I, I don't think about black or white. You know, they're friends. They have always been friends. You know, back in, in the pre, you know, say grade school. You know, I learned how to play sports. You know, and I was good. I could play sports too. Because these guys, no, I didn't play with the, you know, the old guys. You know. These guys would kick my butt, you know, you know. But does that answer your question? Yeah, that's a good answer. Okay. Nice answer. Good story. Um, if you had uh, circumstance to teach a jazz class, let's say a non-musician jazz class, mm -hmm. yeah. let's suppose they were like almost senior citizens, mm -hmm. and some of the people said, I just don't get it when when the musicians just start mm -hmm. going off and they, I don't understand what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to explain jazz improvisation to that kind of yeah. person? Yes, I would tell them they would have to listen more. You know, they would have to listen and maybe start off not listen to Coltrane. Start off listening to Lester Young. It's just like learning a language. If you had a little kid crawling here, he would go and be going, uh, ma, 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 da, ma, you know, he couldn't speak it, even though we're speaking, he, you know, he would then, he would catch it, and catch it, and catch it, and then by the, by the time he's 16, he would say, hey, monk, buy me a car. <laughs> he knows how to speak then, <laughs> you know, or she knows how to, right? Yeah. And so you got, it's, it's, it's learning a language, you know, you have to, you know, get acclimated to it, you know, and as far as liking it, you know, I didn't like broccoli like when I was, you know, five years old or ten years old or fifteen years old. I eat broccoli every day. It grows on you. You know what I mean? And and I know that's a good question because I know this anybody when I when I play, I have a thousand people walk up to me and say, you know, I never heard jazz before, but this is, I like this. You know what I mean? You know, and I have, and I see on people's faces if they've never been to a place before or a concert, they look at you like you're nuts. You know, but maybe we were a little too strong for that for that moment for them. You know, they should go back and listen. You know, listen to the blah blah blah. You know, it's you gotta sometimes acquire a taste, or sometimes you don't have to have time to acquire. Sometimes they hit you right away. You just never knew it. You know, you know. Do you think you change your playing to fit cer certain 
different circumstances. Oh yeah, I do. Okay. Oh, totally. I'm definitely influenced by the moment, you know, and by the place, by the environment. Yeah. Oh sure, definitely. Like if I was to play a concert for a bunch of old people, let's say, I, I would the tunes I would pick would be that way. I would play differently than I would play. I would, you know, definitely. If I play for a, uh, like say a college crowd or you know, you know, definitely. And then even the club, when I play, like I play Smalls a lot, Smalls, Mike. Ah. <laughs> you know? we, we, that's on, uh, you can get that on video live. Oh yeah, right? yeah that's right, that's right. I'm, I'm usually, uh, a couple, uh, one Saturday every month, okay. at 7.30, yeah. And uh, we play, play trio, Bop Juice, it's a trio, Clifford Barbaro, the bass, bass, bass player du jour, and me. Yeah. It's called Bop Juice. It's bass player du jour. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. you know, bass players get too many gigs. So, you know, I have a bunch of guys like you. It's interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They work all the time. So, you right. know, sometimes they can't make 7.30 on a Saturday night. Right. You know? You know? Start going down your list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. some things are the same at any level. That's so. right. That's right. Sure. Oh, definitely. Hell yeah. Okay, but what was the question? <laughs> well, the, well, the question was... Altering your playing somewhat for yeah. different circumstances, yeah. I guess. Yeah, I definitely do that, yes. The crowd, the, yeah. I mean, that's just the way I am. That's just what, you know, you, that's why I had to see things, you know. It's like if you, walk, if you walked in the room and the President of the United States was so here, you would talk to him differently than if the janitor was here, you know. Uh -huh. Not that I, I wouldn't have any less respect for the janitor. Right. Because that's where I grew up. That's where my father was and is. He could talk to anybody about anything. <laughs> so that kind of, that's my influence too. So, I mean, I wouldn't, but I would talk to him differently probably. You know what I mean? <laughs> Has the uh, explosion in technology in the last... You know, 10 years mm. had an effect on what you do? Not what I do, but I think it has an effect on the scene. Yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, because that's the way people are living. And people, especially with the, the well, the computers, I don't feel, you know, even the cell phones, I don't feel like there's so much personal contact. I remember when I was a kid, walked down the, walked down the street, hey, how you doing? <laughs> you know, now it's like you can't even get their attention. They're like, yeah, 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 you know, and they're driving, and you know, it's, it's, you know, stay in your lane, play with you on the. When are we gonna pick out the furniture? You know, you know, they're, they're hugging you like you. Like, like, you want to propose? <laughs> you know, you know. I mean, so I don't know. I just think that that you know, I, I don't know if that's the technology you're talking about, but I think it's the way of the world. And what I like about the technology is the is the way you can communicate. You know, email, I can call Europe for free. <laughs> you know, and email a thousand things at one time. It'd be great. That's great business. I love it. I really do. I love it. I think that's the greatest thing. But if you just spend your, you know, like, I have a lot of students, you know, they, they just got out of high school and their whole life has been this. And that really is, is absorbed because there's so many things to absorb that you don't absorb anything. And then, and then the communication skills, or, I mean, skills, sorry, the communication skills are. And then you know, I said, could you talk? You know, you know, what's your name? <laughs> you know, you know, duh. <laughs> you know, yes. what are you trying to tell me? You know, like you know, because the, the communication skills are down. You know, they don't interact. You know, because and I think that's not. I don't think that's good. We're human beings. You know, <laughs> you got to interact. You got to have relationships. <laughs> you know what I mean? Even in business, why do you? Why do you people be? They have you have relationships with people. Jazz business, lawyer business, doctor business, garbage can business, you know, paint business, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's it's called relationships. <laughs> is there any? Uh, is there a less of an of a, a initiative these days to make recordings because of the way they get sent out? and oftentimes lifted for free. Oh, yeah. I don't know if there's less. I mean, I mean, maybe you wouldn't think that way in philosophy, but in reality, I don't think there's less at all. I think it's more. It's like everybody could do it. You know what I mean? Now, yeah, I don't think it's that... I don't know what the word is. I don't think it works out that well because of that. You know, the download for free, you know, you don't make any money, you know. You know what I mean? I mean, people, you know. So that's... I don't... I'm just saying, the reality doesn't seem like it really has a deterrent on it. <laughs> you know, it seems like it's more. You know, because yeah. it's easier to do. It's easier to do. Yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, anybody can make a record, a CD, anybody, you know. <laughs> so, to me, 
I said, then that, that brings down the quality, too. You know what I mean? Oh, I have a CD out, you know, I listen to it, I say, you know, you really shouldn't. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I'm not saying you couldn't in 10 years, but right now you shouldn't be worrying about that. You should be trying to make relationships. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> you have any short or long-term goals? Well, that, I'm, I'm never good at that. I'm serious. That, that, my wife always asks me. I said, no. I just can live. I just can, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, always thinking ahead. That's my short-term and long-term goal. As I go, I just say, what's the next step? I, I, one thing I have to say about, about myself, I've been living in New York for 35 years, and I never went backwards. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, financially, um, career-wise, you know, I mean, God, you know, God don't hit me. I, mean, I never really get, you know, if I get sick or something, then that, you know, you go backwards. But, I mean, as far as, I always, everything got better. You know? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I have to say that, you know. Do you ever have to work, like, you know, day gigs? Well, I do. I, I do uh, teaching. The teaching. Right? Yeah, and I used to, and then the day gig for me back in the beginning was playing weddings, and, you know, and bar mitzvahs, you know, which I didn't mind that much, but because I, I, I just don't care. I mean, I, and I, yeah, you, you said that yesterday that it was, more, it was better to do that. Yeah, then go work at a, yeah, to, 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 I thought. To do data entry or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. what was that called? When, when you're, when you, that was a word for that. Word processor, but you were something when you were a word processor. Does that make sense? And there's not wrong with that. Believe me, if people get, you know, that's like being a secretary for a corporation. But if you're a musician, you're trying to, you move to New York. <laughs> you understand? You leave your family, you move to New York to come to, what, to make it, I don't know what that means, but make a living at playing your instrument, you know, or writing, or composing, or whatever, you know, or dancing. Why the hell would you leave that and, 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 and go, go be a word processor? You know, it has nothing to do with people who do it or secretary. I don't, you know, that's great. I mean, you know, if you learn the computer more, which I knew more about the computer. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about why would you spend 40 hours a week, make $300 at that time, not now. And then, and, and I can make $250 in, in one wedding and still have a horn in my mouth and, uh, you know, try to pick up the bridesmaid. <laughs> Sorry, baby, that was a long time ago before no, I met no. you. <laughs> Uh, have you ever had a circumstance with a student that had the desire, but really not the inherent mm -hmm. talent? Yes, many times. Okay, and and and, and, I, and I, I teach him how to how to teach. I teach him how to listen. I teach him how to communicate with uh, you know with um, what they know, and 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 they and they will. They, they usually have the talent to absorb knowledge. You know, and and some of them have it. To have a have a talent to communicate, you know, and then as far as playing, then they yeah, but they but I still encourage them to play because it's good therapy. Because <laughs> if you're a teacher, you need therapy. <laughs> you know, I mean, go on, but but they're never, never I could tell they're never going to really you know get off the ground with it on a real high professional level because you know they just you know don't have the talent, but they really have the desire and and, and they want to be involved, and you can be involved. You know, as a teacher, and even a, maybe a speaker, maybe a clinician. You don't have to be a great player to be a clinician. You just got to give out the right information. You know, That's and and also uh, a listener, a, a, a fan. Teach them how to be a fan. You know, I mean, not, I know that sounds selfish, but it's not. You know, this this jazz world needs fans that are into it. To have a passion for it, you know. The best fan is the guy who has a passion for it, not just somebody because they they think it's hip. This this you know the flavor of the month, you know. You know what I mean? You know, That's an excellent answer to that. Question. Oh, no, but it's, it's true. The best answer I've got. Because yeah. You teach them to be a teacher. Or yeah. Kind of fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A fan. Yeah. And they and they they won't have any problem with that because you know because they, they're steak, they can still get off. You know, <laughs> you can still it's it's a lot of satisfaction. <clears throat> Excuse me, man. Well. On that note, <coughs> I'm going to get you to your train. Oh yeah, we got. Oh, no, we're, yeah. we're in good shape here, so. Okay. It's been a real pleasure. But wait a minute, they're supposed to be here. They have my horn and my stuff. They're, they're, they're be here. Okay, but they're taking me, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we better. So we're in good shape. Okay. Thanks for your time. Mom, thank you, man. All right.